Welcome everyone to our first iCoder member meeting of the year. Uh, 2023 is going to be a very, very exciting year. I can't wait to attend the ODR conference in, uh, in Bangalore. Uh, I can't wait to see the APEC and ISO rep reports come out. Yeah, this is going to be a breakthrough year and I can't wait to track it with all of you. So thank you for making time this morning. Meyer, good to see you. Tim, good to see you. Um, it's uh, happy 2023. And we are delighted to have a presentation. And I know I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, Vishwam, so I apologize. But Webnyai. Webnyai That's India. actually right. Okay, yes. good. And I and actually, a friend of mine told me that it means web justice, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. um, I think in the, in the English context, I was like, wow, that's a very interesting name. But um, it, it could not be more apt. So we are delighted to have you here with us. And I think I'd just like to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about the company and um, uh, your, how you came to create it and sort of what, what the work is that you're doing. So, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A with all of our attendees. So please, Vish Vishwam, please, Vishwam, take us away. Thank you so much, Colin. Hi, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. I am in India, so it's evening here. Thank you so much for taking the time, and Happy New Year 2023 to everybody. I'm just going to share my screen, and then we can get started. Uh, just let me know when you can see the screen. Looks good. Is it busy? Yep. Good. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so, wait, so I'll just sort of start with sort of brief introduction. So my name is Vishwam. Uh, previously, I was a lawyer for almost nine years. I worked with Linklaters and DLA Piper, two law firms, mainly did sort of cross-border litigation, international arbitration and mediation, but also did a fair bit of sort of white collar investigations and sanctions work, mainly originating from the US and UK. Uh, and I worked in sort of three different jurisdictions, India, United Kingdom, and the United Arab Emirates. And I'm also sort of qualified in all three jurisdictions. Uh, other than law, I've been I've done sort of a fair bit of public policy work, uh, advised various UN organizations, the World Bank, UNICEF, UNDP, and ILO on various legal issues. Not particularly ODR, actually nothing to do with ODR at all, but more about sort of you know on the labor side, on the child rights side, development, law and poverty, etc. Uh, and previously, I was also sort of co-founded a sort of public policy think tank in India where we work with the World Health Organization and a couple of other sort of advocacies and the governments on various public policy issues. Ishita. Thank you, Vishwam. I am a product designer and manager by background. I have formally studied product design and I have worked with multiple clients across different sectors uh, in India and interna internationally. Uh, I've also worked with the likes of HSBC, Credit Suisse and Suzuki to design experiences for them. Uh, I have driven some community campaigns uh, for Google and World Health Organization as well. Thank you. Uh, so, like Colin mentioned, essentially WebNyai is made of sort of two words, Web and Nyai. And Nyai is the Hindi or Sanskrit word for sort of justice, rules, or judgment. So basically, we just sort of merged the two words, and and we thought, you know, WebNyai is probably an apt name because it's obviously online dispute resolution is sort of trying to resolve disputes online. But essentially, our vision sort of stems from increasing access to justice in courts by using technology. And I know, Colin, you've been involved with sort of the Supreme Court of India and the government on various policies and sort of initiatives that we're doing here in India. But I think a recent study in India was done by the Ministry of Law and Justice. And they said that during the COVID period, because courts had to move online, actually access to justice and specifically access to courts improved substantially because people no longer had to travel, take a day off their work and go to court, etc. So that's the vision we sort of started with. And we sort of started uh, we actually started working on the product before COVID, but we only launched uh, and sort of started getting clients and monetizing during COVID. So essentially we're, we're an ODR in prevention sort of ecosystem and we build customizable solutions which businesses, courts, tribunals, arbitration centers, and lawyers and arbitrators and mediators can use. So very broadly, we have sort of three different sort of products uh, and I'm gonna be focusing on the middle one resolve virtually today. Uh, because I think that's probably the most of interest for people on the call. But essentially, we work uh, with businesses, we work with arbitration centers, we work with lawyers, law firms, uh, mediators, arbitrators, and the eventual goal is to sort of also work with courts and provide the technology there that they would need for an end-to-end -end solution. 
so I'm going to focus on the middle product here today, the Resolve Virtually product. Uh, and essentially, so you mentioned, Colin, why are we sort of building this? So when I was working with, you know, with law firms as a lawyer and doing sort of arbitration work, I realized that there's obviously not much technology that we use as lawyers uh, and even sort of big law firms. I know it's increasing, the trends increased post COVID now, but traditionally there weren't really tools or at least tools that I could find uh, which really helped us in litigation or arbitration. And there was a lot of admin work which we were doing, you know, even sort of senior lawyers were doing a lot of admin work and whatever technology was there, it was sort of general technology that you would use across spectrum, but it wasn't really catered to legal, uh, the legal market. Uh, so that was sort of one driver that, you know, I thought I should build a technology for problems that I was facing uh, when we're working on sort of big ticket disputes. And the other driver was just generally how there is, you know, delays and arrears in Indian courts and there's so much backlog and how we can use technology, sort of clear up that backlog, increase sort of, you know, resolution of disputes online. And with digitization of almost all sectors, we believe, you know, the legal sector has to be digitized. There's literally no option. So the Resolve Virtually product, essentially, we with sort of targeting arbitration centers, uh, arbitrators, lawyers, law firms, and we've sort of got a bunch of features which uh, reduce stress in the process, which make the process faster, cheaper, uh, and obviously much sort of greener as well. So I'm just going to sort of very briefly walk you through some of the features that the product does, and then I'll sort of dive into a sort of quick product demo as well. Uh, but essentially, I guess the, the thing to keep in mind is that what I'm showing you is a product that uh, law firms, arbitrators, mediators, chambers, arbitration centers, uh, and courts could potentially use. The first one is electronic hearing bundle. Essentially, it's it's a sort of hearing bundle. It's a document management system come electronic hearing bundle capability where, and it's meant for sort of the more complex document heavy disputes. So, you know, disputes say in, in the construction space, in the energy space, infrastructure disputes, or just generally very sort of complicated, say MA, commercial or technology disputes, intellectual property disputes as well. So it's meant to sort of, you know, automate a lot of the stuff that junior lawyers or paralegals would traditionally have done uh, for either arbitration or for courts where they prepare bundles and dockets. So we've automated a lot of the stuff where, you know, people can automatically create those dockets and bundles for the hearings. They can do basic stuff like, you know, paginate, OCR, create indices, table of contents, uh, but also sort of hyperlink the entire bundle. So hyperlink your pleadings with, say, your evidence or hyperlink, say, you know, expert reports or witness statements with any evidence, whether documentary or audiovisual files, etc. This sort of follows into the cloud storage and document management system. So we've got a in sort of, you know, something similar to say Dropbox or Google Drive, where you can come and store documents on the cloud. But in addition to storing, you can, it's, a, it's got a sort of sharing and permissioning system where you can share it with others, either internally within your law firm or say with, you know, uh, a King's counsel or Queen's counsel you're working with an instructing barrister or lawyer or on the, the other side as well. So for instance, you know, if, if everybody's there in an arbitration or mediation and you upload some documents, you want to share some or serve some of them to the other side, you could potentially do all of that in the document management system. And what you can also do is sort of track updates. So we've got a sort of wall uh, similar to how, you know, you would get a wall and in, say Instagram or Facebook where you can see what's happening with your friends. You can basically see a snapshot of what's happening across all of your cases in terms of what are the updates, who's doing what. And I'll show you some of this uh, in the product demo as well. Virtual hearing and breakout rooms, essentially just we've got, you know, dedicated sort of hearing rooms, whether for its mediation or arbitration, and then we've got breakout rooms. Uh, and again, these rooms are sort of customizable. Different people will have access to different rooms depending on your role and what you need. Uh, but I'll focus on some of this more, I think, when we come to the demo. Uh, one thing uh, is that there is a complete audit trail of all actions in the room. So, you know, he said this, she said that, and what happened, who said what documents, who was delaying responding to, say, the arbitrator or the mediator, who was delaying in providing evidence, etc. So there is a complete audit trail of everything that happens in a hearing room or a breakout room. And it's sort of pretty easy to sort of, you know, get a copy of the audit trail if you have to say produce it later in, in a court of law or if you need it for some other purposes. Electronic presentation of evidence. So essentially this is to sort of, you know, cut down obviously on paper that you would use traditionally in courts or arbitrations. We have a mechanism where you can uh, present evidence online, but also we can help you with an EP pro operator sort of present evidence online. 
So basically, lawyers or mediators or arbitrators can, you know, just focus on uh, on the actual stuff, on the substantive stuff, and not having to worry about, you know, sharing your screen or referring to documents, etc., and putting them on screen for everyone. So we've got an automated system for that, and we provide EP operators as well. Uh, we've got sort of dashboards. I think this is probably the obvious one where you can sort of manage all your caseload, see what's happening across cases. Uh, dashboard is sort of integrated with sort of uh, calendar and everything as well. Uh, so you can sort of uh, manage, you know, there are obviously calendar and email integrations. So you can schedule meetings, hearings, and there is email automation and SMS automation. So, you know, if you need any updates, you can customize what email notification you need, what SMS notification you need, and all of that organization is sort of built in. So that's just quickly on the product. Uh, in terms of users, so we've, uh, I think we've been doing this for about 18 months, I would say, just about 18 months. We've seen arbitrations, uh, arbitration mediation both, but predominantly arbitrations uh, happening in over 25 countries, users from different 25 countries using the platform. Uh, so that's, uh, it's, we haven't had any use case so far in the US uh, or in the Americas, basically. But I think predominantly, we've seen most of our users focus in the Middle East, Central Asia regions, and increasingly in Africa and Southeast Asia as well. Uh, these are some of the institutional cases that we've supported, uh, specifically on arbitration. So pretty much, I think, broad, if you are, leave the Americas, we've had ICC, LCIA, Cairo Arbitration Center, Dubai Arbitration Center, and in India, we've seen the Delhi International Arbitration Center and the Indian Council of Arbitration. Uh, and we've sort of got some partnerships and recognitions uh, as well there. Uh, just sort of following on from partnerships. So obviously our focus traditionally to begin with was in India, but we've, like I mentioned, you know, almost people from 25 countries have used it. Uh, and we're sort of increasing our partnerships and sort of collaborations across the world, sort of get more and more people to resolve disputes online or at least have an online version when they're in-person hearings or mediation or arbitrations. Uh, just quickly on transcription, speech to text and court reporting. So this is what we've seen is basically, you know, most arbitrations and to some extent mediation are now adopting transcription. Uh, so essentially this is sort of just speech to text technology uh, that we've been building on. Uh, we have sort of transcribers as well, uh, on a, sort of who we work with. Some of them are our own employees, but some of them are sort of on an outsourced basis as well. And we're also sort of working with leading sort of APIs, uh, which do speech to text. Uh, so we sort of adopt an approach where technology is assisted by humans, which can transcribe your hearings or anything you want in real time, uh, almost real time, and provide you a transcript, say, at the end of the day of the hearing or on the next day. So it's a mix of sort of human transcript transcriber expertise plus uh, sort of a APIs out there in the market, some of the best ones we use. Uh, calendar and email notification I already spoke about. Uh, this this actually we're just sort of building out. We've seen that uh, a lot of the law firms globally that we work with uh, need sort of, you know, some sort of ALSP expertise. And we're not really an ALSP, but, you know, they need someone to do say litigation bundling work or arbitration bundling work, etc. cetera. Uh, so we work with sort of certain alternative legal service providers uh, and we can get sort of, you know, paralegal or lawyer support if needed pretty much uh, around the clock and at a very short notice as well. And some of the lawyers we work with have sort of worked with, you know, Magic Circle, US law firms in across jurisdictions. Uh, and obviously we have sort of India lawyers as well. So that's one, just sorry, quickly, I'm sorry, I think my uh, order of the presentation is messed up for some reason, uh, but these are just sort of some testimonials that we recently had uh, and most of them are actually from international arbitration, where we provided the bundle in India for arbitration seated in Germany, Australia, Dubai, Cairo, uh, and predominantly was sort of electronic presentation of evidence, electronic hearing bundle, transcription, and then sort of virtual hearings as well. So that's the end of the presentation here. I'm going to move to the product demo. Colin, I don't know if you want me to stop now for any question on the presentation, or should we just take those in the end? I think the better thing to do is go right into the demo. And then we okay. can just do the QA, Q and A after. Okay, perfect. Uh, so this is a, just a, a sort of staging server instance of so Tashkent International Arbitration Center is one of our clients. Uh, they use our technology end to end for case management, and we're doing this for certain other arbitration centers as we speak. So what we've done is we've just created an instance of the platform that they use uh, on our staging server on the staging cloud, and I'm going to run you through some of uh, the features. 
on the portal. This is not the totality of the portal, and this is definitely not the other two products which I mentioned. This is purely on the Resolve Virtually product, but I think this would give you a good idea of sort of what we do and what all you could do potentially on the portal. So this is just the dashboard, uh, and we can sort of customize languages here for different people. We're just using Google Translate for now, but for Tashkent, we have sort of Russian and Uzbek. Uh, but we're sort of working on more language, language and lingual capability, especially for uh, French and Arabic, because that's what I think we've seen in the market, people wanting French and Arabic uh, translation and sort of language capabilities. Uh, but essentially what you can see on the dashboard is as your cases, which you have as claimant and respondent. Uh, and this is more for arbitration, but I'll tell you how it would sort of differ for mediation. So I've logged in from, a, say, a party account, uh, the claimant, and you can see all of your cases here in terms of, you know, what cases are open and closed where you are the claimant and what cases are open and closed if you're the respondent. So the process is pretty similar for if you're a lawyer or counsel. It slightly differs if you are an arbitrator or mediator, of course, because then you're not really a claimant or respondent. Then it's more about, you know, the cases you have open and closed as an arbitrator, as a, as a mediator, and then you can classify as arbitrator, whether you're the presiding arbitrator or chairperson or, or just a party nominated or other arbitrator. Uh, this is the sort of wall I spoke about. Essentially, this is a snapshot of what's happened uh, across all your open cases in terms of who's uploaded documents, uh, who's deleted documents, who's shared or served certain documents. It also will tell you about upcoming hearings. Uh, this feed is sort of customizable. So if you don't want to see all of this feed, you can customize and turn off certain notifications, or you can pick what feed you want. If you don't want a file management feed in terms of documents, you can pick, you know, I only want to be notified about upcoming hearings or about upcoming meetings, et cetera, or you want to be notified about something else. So you can sort of customize the activity feed. Let me go into one or two cases. So we've got a system where, uh, I think this is specifically to TI, which so you can sort of obviously register disputes and everything. But I've opened a sort of a registered dispute here. When you click here, you can then see activity specific only to that case. So the earlier one you saw on the wall was across all cases. This is specifically to this case. Again, you can customize the activity here. And then you can see sort of basic details in terms of your case ID, date of submission, et cetera. Because this is arbitration, then you know if the arbitration is closed, you could potentially download your final award or Intel award, et cetera. For mediation, it sort of slightly differs uh, the screen. Uh, but again, you can get copies. You can see all the people here. And if you click on anybody, then basically you can see their details in terms of their name, uh, email ID, phone number, and other details that they provide on the portal. Uh, I'm going to take you through the, the document management system that I mentioned. So this is essentially the, you know, the Dropbox or say one one drive google drive equivalent you can sort of upload folders and files here and once you when you upload folders or files you can basically you know uh decide who you want to give permissions sorry i forgot to do that uh you can also do it once it's uploaded so you can see everybody who's in that dispute uh and their profile will also come up and then you can give them permissions in terms of whether they can only view the document or they can you know delete the document Delete will automatically give them edit permissions. If you, uh, so you can basically pick what uh, permissions you want to give them in terms of view, delete, etc. So let me just give something. And you can also then notify them here. So if you pick these, then they'll send out emails to them saying, you know, so and so it served certain documents or shared certain documents with you. And then once they log into the portal, they will then be able to see the document. And you can always sort of edit permissions. Uh, here as well if you don't want to have them uh, if you don't want to share the document with them you can change permissions but otherwise it's sort of a basic version of what a dropbox etc can do in terms of you know creating files folders moving things around renaming deleting files etc let me now go to let me go to the hearing rooms first uh, so this is the sort of staging server hearing room so pardon the room the names of the rooms here but essentially Think of this as you know like digital conferencing or a courtroom facility there are different rooms different people have access to different rooms and in every room you can basically you know exchange messages you can uh so i think that's on the other side uh you can exchange messages you can do audio recordings so this is actually uh this was something required in india because a lot of the people wanted to just communicate in their own language uh so we've seen that you know how you can sort of record audio on whatsapp people 
actually really use this feature in terms of audio recording instead of actually typing out stuff. You can also use this, you know, for like exchanging, say, closing arguments or really uh, or verbal arguments. You can obviously upload files and everything. Any files that you upload basically pop up here in terms of a shared media. So once this goes about four or five, there's a list here and you can click here and then see all the documents exchanged. Uh, and again, every room is separate and different people have access to different rooms. So for mediation, it's obviously different rooms. For arbitration, it's different rooms. And if people want additional rooms, we can always create it pretty easily with the click of a button and give access to those rooms to different people. Each room uh, has two video conferencing capabilities. One is simple Zoom integration. So if I click on Zoom, it will just start a Zoom meeting and you don't really need any uh, Zoom account or premium Zoom subscription. It'll automatically create a Zoom the premium account subscription for you when you start the meeting uh, with everybody. Uh, and if you don't want to use Zoom, we have our own video conferencing. Uh, this is completely in-house inbuilt. So there is no data being exchanged with Zoom. Obviously in the other one, you have, uh, you know, it, the Zoom account sort of runs on Zoom servers, but this runs on our own servers. Uh, and you've got pretty much all functionalities here in terms of uh, what you want to do in terms of full screen, you know, should raise your hand, share screen, gallery view. Uh, you can live stream and you can record as well. Uh, so any recordings you actually do either on Zoom or uh, the inbuilt video conferencing pop up here. There's a list of all recordings in that room here. So basically the hearing rooms are built in a way that there's a complete audit trail of everything, messages you exchange, recordings are here, documents you exchange are here, and there are two VCs at hand. Uh, there are calendars and everything, of course, you can schedule meetings. Maybe I'll go into the calendar. So you can sort of schedule meetings, uh, calendar. This is currently not integrated with uh, Google or Microsoft, and the reason for that is pure sort of data confidentiality and sensitivity, uh, because obviously if we open this up with uh, Google or Microsoft or any other calendar, then data is being shared with them. Uh, so this is currently a completely in-house uh, calendar that we have. There's no external data sharing at all. And you can obviously search in everything uh, across rooms or within a room. So that's for the hearing rooms. We've, uh, okay, sorry, calendar I showed you, you can sort of easily schedule meetings and everything, fairly basic. One thing we do have, uh, and we don't have the full functionality here in the saving server, is but you can create, uh, we've got doc automation to create different sorts of documents. Uh, so the one that you can see here is basically just in terms of reference and procedural order that you would have in say, international arbitrations. What it does, it it basically allows you to create different sets of documents automatically. But and if I open this up, basically you know you'll see a terms of reference that we've sort of created for the parties in the dispute. Uh, this is currently based on TX framework, the Tashkent International Arbitration Center, but this is completely customizable. And for ad hoc arbitration, we have sort of a different format which people can use. Uh, and generate documents. I think that's uh, okay. So yeah, so this is I think specifically for Tashkent. Uh, we've used it in different formats for our ad hoc arbitration. But let me just give you a quick snapshot of this. This is how you can start a new dispute. Uh, so basically, there are these various sort of uh, requirements that you need to do. And you can see it's all sort of multilingual in sort of English, Russian, and Uzbek. But you can put in details. So I'm the claimant, so that's already done. But I can put in claimant council details, respondent, respondent council, and they'll give you option to the upload certain documents. Uh, and again, it'll ask you for certain information that if you want to nominate arbitrators, in case of mediation, it'll be if you want to nominate mediators, etc. cetera, uh, and then certain additional information. So this is essentially we have an entire sort of customizable process in terms of starting arbitrations or mediations. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, you can have one set of login details on the portal, uh, which we generate, or you can generate yourself and then you can come in and, you know, send out invitations to the portal to everybody, whether it's your lawyers, it's your arbitrators, mediators, the other side, the other side's lawyers, multiple claimants, respondents, defendants, etc. So it's, it's, it's built in a sort of pretty self-service DIY format where uh, we sort of customize with different blocks and then you can start arbitration and invite others and do everything on the portal. Uh, I'm going to go to electronic hearing bundle, but Ishita, I just want to see if I missed out anything uh, on this portal. No, I think you covered everything. Okay, perfect. Uh, just give me one second. So for electronic hearing bundles, actually we couldn't, uh, we were trying to find a set which did not have any confidential information. 
but we couldn't find. So what we've done is we've sort of just redacted information based on an existing set. And I'm going to send, show you some screenshots, but that should give you a fair idea on in terms of how it works. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Yeah, let me know when you can see it. We can see it. Perfect. So this is just a snapshot of I think what you saw in the sort of the document management system where you can store files. Uh, essentially, to create sort of you know uh, electronic heading bundles for headings, it's again customizable in terms of you know pagination, stamping. You want to create indices. You want to create table of contents, etc. So there's various functionalities, all of that built in. But what I wanted to show you, I want to show you one document in terms of the hyperlinking features. So for in, and you must have seen this elsewhere as well, well, but essentially, you know, you can hyperlink your evidence in your written submissions or readings. So we use a sort of tagging system where you can tag uh, different documents, different pages, and you can basically refer to the exact page number of that document. So for instance, you know, if, if, if you were to, uh, if you are referring to a contract specification volume in your written submission or your pleadings, and you want to basically refer to the source document, which is the contract specification, you can basically click uh, on this tab uh, and basically it'll open up the exact page of electronic hearing manual. So we basically have this hyperlinking system where you can hyperlink across your electronic hearing bundle uh, and to the exact document and to the exact page. Uh, so this and this is obviously all in addition to the usual stuff that you can do for you know courts court litigation or arbitration in terms of preparing bundles automatically uh, and we've sort of seen this extensively being used by a lot of international law firms specifically in sort of you know construction arbitrations uh, or arbitration in the energy and logistics transportation sector because they tend to be quite document heavy and they often sort of have you know tens of thousands of documents which will be referred to during the hearings and in your evidence and in your submissions. Uh, so that's it actually. Uh, that's it from my side. Wow, very, very impressive, Vishwam. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, Ishita, great, great job putting it together. It's a very intuitive and extremely, extremely powerful platform. So let me just ask you a couple questions first. So you talked about Tashkent. Uh, that's very impressive to handle the multilingual support in Tashkent. And you said you're working on French and Arabic. Um, what what geographies? I mean, is there a lot of usage of the platform in India as well? Yes. So the, uh, in, there's a lot of usage in India as well. But I think most court proceedings in India happen in English, mm -hmm. or at least the higher courts you would know are all in English. So we've not seen that much sort of requirement for adding other languages. Mm -hmm. We do have some sort of integrations with five different regional languages. But it's more basic because we've seen there's not much demand or there's not much requirement to fully have it in hindi for instance got it absolutely well uh, i love the audio recording functionality too that's amazing and the inline video so you have both zoom and you have your own video platform that's fantastic can i ask about how you handle payments i mean do you have financial management and billing and invoices yes. and things like that yes yes absolutely we do so uh, we, we do have a financial dashboard and everything. So I guess it also depends on who's using it. So we have sort of two or three different sorts of financial dashboards. Mm -hmm. uh, in case of Tashkin, obviously they have like an admin sort of dashboard in terms of, you know, receiving payments from parties, sending out payments to arbitrators, mediators. So that's one level of dashboard. Then we've got arbitrators in India who handle, you know, sort of 40 arbitrations on the portal across dashboard. So then we have a separate invoicing system for them. Uh, where they can sort of see in terms of, you know, what invoices have been issued, what the payment mechanisms is. Uh, so far, we've only connected with digital payment infrastructure in India. Mm. We've not integrated with, say, Stripe or PayPal or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in India, you could use the sort of digital payment stack. Mm -hmm. uh, so in India has UPI. So we've sort of connected to UPI and other digital payment providers where you can receive and, you know, pay out Got it. you want to. I'm, I'm definitely going to ask you about the Indian environment, too, because there's so much that's happening there. But it, it does seem, I mean, the platform is so powerful. I could see it supporting court cases. I could see it supporting, you know, high dollar value commercial arbitrations as well. So it, it seems like uh, there's really no upper limit to the case complexity in terms of what it can handle. Is that, but are you also doing like the low dollar value kind of digital payment type transactions, too? It seems like a lot of your functionality may be you know, uh, beyond the needs of parties, you know, if it's just a dispute over a purchase, like an e-commerce purchase. 
Yeah. So we, we are doing that, Colin, but that's the separate product. That's the commercial, the CDR product. Mm -hmm. So I've not shown you that product today, but we are working with more than 100 businesses in India who are using the portal for sort of low value, high value. Fantastic. That's great. Well, the last question I'll ask, I want to open it up to other people to, to get their comments as well, is panel management. You know, like um, having applicant supply and tracking all of their expertise and, you know, maybe tracking their performance across cases. Do you have features like that as well? Uh, not very advanced. We're not tracking performance through technology yet. Uh, that is part of our roadmap. Uh, it's not an uh, immediate priority, I would say, but we do have a panel of arbitrators, mediators only for India as of now, uh, which we use in these sort of high volume, low value disputes. Uh, but other than having a panel, I think we sort of do everything manually right now. Got it. Uh, well, I have to say, I'm I'm really impressed. It's a it's a it's a fantastic product, and I think the sky's the limit. So why don't I open it up and and see? Do others have comments or questions for Vishwam and Shida? I certainly have more, unless anybody wants to keep going. Yeah, I do. Please, <laughs> Meyer. Yeah, this is very interesting to me. I, I think I need to let uh, Vishram know, some of the others already know. I operate a large system uh, for the LA court um, system, which is the largest integrated courts in the country. It's got several hundred courts in the county, and we have 80,000 cases filed a year. And they're of all different types. We handle, we're called a vendor resource for low cost mediation. We have a panel of 20 lawyer mediators who handle uh, civil cases. Um, and um, it's been working pretty well. Uh, the court just appointed a new ADR administrator. So I think it's a good time for um, Vishwam to have a meeting with the court administrator to see about the possibility of expanding what we're doing. There's one other program, uh, uh, one other service provider called ADR Services. They're well known. They have judges and lawyers as well. But it's a very extensive program. We've had hundreds of cases. We developed our own software using Zoho for case administration. But I think it could be improved. Uh, and I like what you've provided, what you've developed. And I, I would like to talk with you further about the cost of what would it cost to implement such a program and if uh, if the LA Superior Court and frankly we're getting cases from all over Southern California from Ventura Bakersfield from San Diego from uh, Orange County so we have a massive amount of cases that are coming through and um, we just need a better system I think for operating and we're also thinking of expanding it to non-lawyers for simple cases like unlawful detainers and other types of programs so it would be good to have a, a conversation with you and the ADR administrator at the court to see if possible what you have can be adapted to our needs, which is, uh, as I say, it's it's quite an extensive program. Lots Absolutely. Of uh, yeah. So I would appreciate it. Thank you, Meyer. Actually, that raises a couple of good points, Vishwam. Do you have any clients in the Americas? Are you looking to expand in this geography? Thank you, Meyer. Thank you, Colin. We're definitely looking to expand. We Currently, don't have any clients based out of US. We've obviously had US firms with offices in the Middle East and Africa mm -hmm. use the portal for arbitration seated there. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, in terms of courts, we've uh, initially worked with DIFC courts, but that was only on a moot court competition that they did uh, earlier last, late last year. But we are in discussion with a few courts in the Middle East region to see how we can help them around case management. Uh, but but definitely, Mag, I, I'm I'm very keen to sort of see if we can help you out in the LA or otherwise in the Americas with case administration. There's a lot of, other than automation, there's a lot of other stuff as well, which we've done for Tashkent and for other centers, mm -hmm. specifically around machine learning and NLP. And we're continuously working on that as well. So so definitely we are sort of quite keen to see if we can expand. Uh, I also would like to know about how long does it take to onboard somebody to learn, run, learn the technology because it looks quite extensive. It took us a while to develop our program and a little bit of time to onboard, but we've got an administrator who's doing very well. I'm just curious about the back end and the, the, the timing it takes to develop your program, uh, customize it and imp implement it. And what is the general cost for that? I think the timeline actually depend. It depends on sort of various factors in terms of what we need to customize and what 
tools we can sort of use on a plug and play basis. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's basically like Lego, you know, what, what blocks we can use as it is and combine and how much effort and time it takes us to combine those blocks or what we need to customize and build for you. But, but we do offer the entire portal on a white label basis as well. So if you don't want any webinar branding, it can just be your internal sort of branding without any webinar branding. In terms of cost, I think we can discuss separately. I think it obviously depends on a number of variables, uh, but we can obviously work with something, you know, that, that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. I want to jump on something else you said, Vishwam, which is about natural language processing and AI. You know, that's a hot, hot topic here in Silicon Valley because we have chat GPT sort of raging across the internet. I think um, a lot of the hype around blockchain and metaverse has kind of evaporated in terms of the tech pullback. But the AI hype is bigger than ever. And this is going to be a big thing in arbitration, mediation. Uh, negotiation and the law more generally. So can you tell us a little bit uh, about what you're thinking about there and what work you've done? Yes. So specifically on NLP, uh, Colin, so what we're doing is we're sort of working with emails. So we're, we're sort of working with emails and disputes in a way that they can almost be interchangeable mm -hmm. in terms of the portal. So whatever you do on our portal right now in terms of coming up, you know, filling a, a smart form, filling right, typing a message, we're working on how it can all be done over email and vice versa. Uh, so we're integrating that we're using a lot of NLP around email. So, you know, how you can file disputes by over email, how you can respond disputes, how you can sort of create pleadings, et cetera. Uh, so basically trying to reproduce the entire experience, which is on the portal on say email, because that's what traditionally lawyers do. And that's what, you know, traditionally they're more comfortable with what, from what we've seen, whether it's law firms, arbitration centers, uh, arbitrators or mediators. So that's the sort of work we've been doing on the NLP side. And some of it is already in place uh, with the TIAC, the Tashkent Arbitration Center. We've used mm -hmm. it for companies in India on the other portal that we work with. But I think more generally on AIML, we are sort of working on a, on a bunch of things. We're exploring, we're looking at chat GPT as well in terms of how we can leverage that either into our existing tech stack or what changes we need to make to sort of leverage chat GPT. I mean, the new version of chat GPT, I think that's four is also predicted sometime this year. That's right. Uh, so we're definitely sort of trying to uh, brainstorm and see what we can do when we're speaking to lawyers and clients and potential clients to see, you know, what they would benefit out of from say chat GPT expertise. So that's a couple of those things are in the works. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I mean, I personally think, um, uh, you know, AI in and of itself, is not really that valuable to a mediator or arbitrator. You've got to have a platform within which those services can be delivered. And I think that your platform is great. If somebody's in a chat environment, they're already interacting, then that's a natural place where that kind of chat GPT type interface could contribute. You know, maybe for case triage, maybe for even just administrative tasks, you know, like you could give natural language commands and the platform would understand how to interpret them. So very exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Other comments, questions? Please call them. Thanks, Colin. A great presentation, amazing technology. Um, but following up on, on a couple of the earlier questions, um, I mean, this technology is meant for the big user, the uh, large cases, the established large law firms. Um, and my practice isn't a mediator and arbitrator, but my practice doesn't go into that kind of uh, arbitration, for example. Uh, when you've got this the way you want it, are you planning to have almost a light version of it that could be used by you know, a mediation arbitration group or a sole practitioner. And I have one other question after that, um, which is where are you storing the data? Yeah, uh, so Colm, we actually do have that light version. I didn't present it today, but the, we're using the light version in India, uh, only that lawyers and arbitrators can do. So to give you an example, we have arbitrators in India and traditionally arbitrators in India are sort of retired Supreme Court and High Court judges. That's just the way it's been, but we've had We've seen cases where people come on just for one or two cases, but also retired chief justice of India using it for a bunch of say 40 arbitrations that are ongoing. So we've seen every, anyone from one to sort of 40 uh, in terms of light version being used and they just use it to manage everything in terms of, you know, they use the dashboard, the document management system. Uh, some of them would use it for electronic hearing bundles if it's document heavy, otherwise they wouldn't. They'd use the transcription, virtual hearing rooms, breakout rooms, calendar, etc. One thing I didn't mention, 
our I didn't show actually is analytics. We've got analytics as well, especially if you have a, a sort of big data set and you have multiple arbitration mediations, we can do some interesting things in terms of showing, you know, uh, how your cases have been running, what is the delay, what's been the time between hearings, et cetera. So there are a couple of sort of analytics as well, uh, depending on use case and depending on whether it's massive or sort of light use case. Uh, so that's already in, in operation. We've had that, I just didn't show it today. The second question, it's currently on AWS in India, uh, but I'm sure you know that, you know, it, if you if you have to deploy it and say, if we have, if you want to serve us in Germany or in the US, then we can just create an instance and sort of move it there. Uh, so far, we've not had a requirement to move the data outside India, but uh, I don't think that should be very difficult if we have to do that. And obviously it has to make commercial sense as well, but it shouldn't be a, a tricky thing to do at all. Yeah, I know uh, we've done some work in Canada and there are laws that require that the data stay only in Canada. And that's one of the challenges because with, with a lot of these platforms, it's very easy to ping servers in other geographies. You know, for instance, the video conferencing is, you know, it's very difficult to sequester the data in a particular area, but uh, presumably your features can be turned on and off as is appropriate. And as you say, you can spin it up on any AWS instance anywhere in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, like, like you would have seen, the only outside integration we have is Zoom. Everything else is pretty much built in-house. So there's, mm -hmm. if, if it's in Canada, for instance, and I don't know where Zoom servers are, but we could turn off Zoom and then just create an instance for AWS in Canada, and then pretty much everything is in Canada. Got it. Fantastic. Yeah, this, sorry, Colin. Please, no, Colin. Yeah, I mean, this was an issue uh, back in March 2020 when everybody suddenly jumped on Zoom uh, the day before they couldn't mm -hmm. do anything online, but the day after they were becoming very upset. And one of the issues came up originally in Zoom from, a, I, I'm based in Toronto, basically, in, in, okay. So one of the things that did come up was data. And we have quite different laws. And there's even, uh, you know, it's not just data being stored in India or data being stored in the UK. It's just the issue of the data being in Canada. Um, even with the US, there's different laws. So, uh -huh. so it is something I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in, particularly as you see these bigger, more complex systems coming together. Um, so, yeah. yeah, and uh, Colm knows because we were talking throughout that period, but um, back at my company, Modrio, we wanted to service a public Canadian client, and they said, you need to host in Canada. Well, we didn't have AWS at that point, but we had put it in the IBM cloud, which did have a node there. And we thought, okay, great, it's all located there, it's gonna be fine. But then we started to watch and just, it's amazing how modern software pings out all over the place. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Zoom, people look at Zoom servers, it's pinging China, it's pinging Europe. I mean, it's just, these things spider out a lot. So it's very hard to ring fence your data in a server and make sure that it doesn't leave. I'm not, I'm not um, saying anything about your platform in particular, just that everything is so interconnected now. It's, it's very difficult to do that and say, okay, we're just going to make sure the data only lives on this server and it's not pinging out any place else. But um, I, I, I think that this is going to be something that's really important for all of us who are ODR platform designers to think through because there's so many great tools that you can use and frameworks you can utilize, but you don't even realize all the different components that they may be pulling in. So um, yeah, that's going to be something we have to work on over time in order to comply with these uh, government requirements. Yeah. So uh, that wasn't really a question, but uh, let me let me throw a couple other things at, your, you, at you. It seems to me that India is the hottest geography for ODR in the world right now. You know, uh, you mentioned the government reports and Niti Ayog did a big research report. You know, the Modi government seems to be pushing ODR very hard. And that's one of the reasons why we're excited that the ODR forum is going to be in Bengaluru in March. Um, what's your sense of the Indian market now? I mean, you're you're talking to law firms, you're talking to arbitral institutions, you're talking to corporations. Are they open to it? Are they excited about it? Is this something that they want to invest in? Um, how how ripe is the market in in India for your product? Uh, my personal sense is that it is still early days. Mm. Uh, people are interested, and there is traction and more adoption in the market, but I don't think we've reached that inflection point where everyone wants ODR. Mm -hmm. I think there is push from the government. There is some push from the judiciary, from the courts. Uh, but I think, I'm not sure if we will get to that inflection point so this year. It could take another three years or more or less. Interesting. Uh, but it's definitely going in the right direction. Uh, 
I would say. Well, I, I've been on a panel or two with uh, Chief Justice Chandrachud, and he has been like, I mean, if I if we could have a Supreme Court justice that would say the things that he has said about ODR, I would be delighted. Uh, so to have a young sort of forward focused leader at the top of the justice system, I think sometimes that's the way change occurs. Because, you know, they get to say, we're going to do this, and then it happens. But uh, the other thing it seems to me in India is the government is very involved. As you say, they're creating APIs for payments. They're creating their own ODR frameworks. Uh, do you think that that's going to create um, constraints on, com on um, uh, competition? I mean, or is that going to unleash many more new providers in the market? Um, what, what's your sense of that? Yeah. Uh, are you, do you fear or welcome public involvement? No, I think definitely welcome. I think the government, and like you mentioned, Justice Chandrachud, who happens also to be the, the chairperson of the Technology Committee for Courts in India, I think they're very welcoming of technology generally uh, for justice system. And I think it's a good thing because essentially, I think if, if we look at justice delivery system, uh, it's traditionally obviously been sort of a government sort of role and we can always sort of debate about you know courts being a service place etc but at least the way indian culture is or the way people look at justice in india they would rather even today go to court than go to an arbitrator or mediator mm. or they would trust the court much more than they would trust an arbitrator or mediator and i'm saying on this on a comparative basis from what i've seen when i worked in the uk or in the uae or in other jurisdictions so people would still trust the court much more than an, an arbitrator or mediator, which is why if the government and the courts are actually backing ODR in technology generally, I think it massively increases trust in ODR. Trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think it's, it's a very good thing. And I think it's really good for ODR in India. Great. I have heard some horror stories about arbitration in India where <laughs> the processes were not conducted in an ethical way and it seemed like there was some bias and i've heard about people getting arbitration awards and they didn't even change the names from the prior award they just you know sent it out so again that may be cherry picking because i don't know about the industry writ large but yeah. trust is is really essential for the rollout yeah. of these systems um so the other thing i want to uh, just get your sense on and i do want to open it up for other people's comments and questions as well um is the legal industry in india uh, you know, I think we've seen with the rollout of dispute resolution and online dispute resolution, oftentimes there's resistance from the bar associations because the lawyers feel, well, this is going to mean fewer billable hours for me. If these cases go to dispute resolution, then that means they're not going to go to court and then I'm not going to be able to you know, charge my normal rates. So the bar associations often will throw obstacles in the path of the growth of technology like this because they see it as a threat to their livelihood. Um, what's your sense of the supportiveness of the bar in India towards innovations like this? Yeah, I think it's it's been a it's been lukewarm. I think it's definitely on the positive side more, mm -hmm. uh, and they are sort of increasingly adopting it. But I think there is still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, column, please. Yeah, the uh, idea of government involvement giving legitimacy. To, uh, to ODR, I think is really important. Um, if you want to have a sense of how some lawyers are viewing online tribunals, in Ontario, there's a, a condo authority tribunal, a funny online tribunal, and there's been a lot of criticism. Um, and part of it, I think, is because how do you fit it into the traditional billing, as Colin said? Um, part of it is just, we don't do things that way. So I think it's very difficult to to say where the legal uh, profession stands on it. It's a conservative one. Um, but the thing that actually concerns me looking at this, and Colin and I have spoken for years about things like this, is there's a, a real lack of lawyers in this discussion. You know, we're talking about changing the system of justice, um, leaving the private side, which is what I'm really interested in, on, aside. And yet, apart from generally feeling, well, there's a negative view of it, or maybe a slightly more positive now, they're not really involved uh -huh. to the degree they should be, which I think may cause problems later on. I don't know how you engage, but it just has struck me a number of times. Anyway, just comment. No, absolutely. Meyer, did you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the experience that we've had. Our attorneys in LA County and the Southern California region 
a pretty well accepted <clears throat> ODR and prefer it if you consider the large distances we have to travel to get to offices in LA and the waste of time of parking and the traffic and so forth, I think ODR has become a uh, de rigor in the, in, the, in the legal profession. And uh, the court issued an LDR contract to us in 2018 before the pandemic. Uh -huh. And we've been using that. We're the only court authorized vendor resource for ODR. And all of our all of our mediations have been online since 2020, mm. and uh, we've handled hundreds of mediations all online, which we've administered through our new program. Uh, uh, so I just want to let people know that I think it's become quite acceptable to lawyers who want to avoid the extra cost to their clients. Sometimes there are good attorneys who want to reduce the cost, and they say, "Let's go to mediation online with MCLA." It only will cost you $225 for three hours. And, and it's, a, it's an easy sell. That's why we're getting a stream of cases coming in. So I think the price point is important. The quality of the mediators is also important. And I think that the system that uh, signs the cases has to be efficient. So all of these have to be in place. And the, the court, as I said, has a new ADR uh, program administrator just came on this month. And I've just invited her to join if she can join, but I think she ought to be involved in this because it's a massive system and I think it can transform the way we do mediations and business in California, uh -huh. at least. So I'm happy for this. Colin, please. Again, following on that, ma'am, I think most lawyers in Ontario have moved to the idea of doing at least virtual mediations and arbitrators have been doing it for quite a while. I think that's not the problem. But somewhat bizarrely, I mean, we have a mandatory mediation system in Toronto, in Ottawa, and in the Windsor area near Detroit. Um, and part of that is you have, you know, you have to go through it. Bizarrely, the the practice direction from the Superior Court, the default for mediation is in person, um, not online. And hmm. we were all expecting to be online. And if you needed to do it in person, that was different. The same with other court procedures that. You know, people have become used to doing um, virtually. So it, it's really a very gray area. I know that <clears throat> all of the lawyers that I deal with, I can't think of one who said, no, I'd rather do it in person. And again, it is distance, it is cost. And so, you know, I'm just surprised it hasn't been taken up more in Canada, given the vast geographic distances as well. So I think it's a really interesting topic. Yeah, I, I, I think in the United States, in the mediation field, we've done some studies at Mediate.com that indicate that online is now the new default and face to face is the exception. You know, in India, I mean, we've heard about these horrendous co delays in the civil courts, you know, 10, 13, 15 years. I mean, people are willing their cases to their descendants because they, you know, they die before they can actually get justice. It seems to me there's a hugely compelling, you know, value prop. Uh, for the move into these more efficient systems. And I think, Vishwam, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, it's inevitable that the law, the justice systems are going to digitize, just like every other industry, medicine and entertainment and payments and finance. It's, it's all digitized. So it's just the law is moving more slowly because it is a public monopoly and it's controlled by you know, the bar associations and by the courts. So they aren't subject to the same competitive pressures, I think, that other industries are. But um, I, you know, I, I call him, I makes an excellent point. I've seen mediation, it's moved online, it's never going to go back, we're never going to go back to 2019. But what, what I see in the courts, and what I see in international arbitration, is that there is a temptation to, okay, let's get back to quote, unquote, normal now. You know, let's 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 take our cases back into the courthouse. Let's take our you know, take our our hearings back in in the face to face process. And that may be because there's more money so they can afford to put people on planes. But what, what are your what's your what's your sense on all of this, uh, Vishwam? Do you do you think uh, uh, do you think uh, these dynamics that we've identified in the U.S., these are playing out in India as well? And how long do you think it'll take for these transformations to occur? I, I agree. I think I think these changes are happening in India, and obviously India is sort of being influenced by what's happening uh, globally. I think it will take probably more time. Uh, I mean, there is this. I've seen a lot of people say that you know, in in India, you can almost sort of leap through technology. So India basically moved from two G to four G. It never had three G, for instance. I think Sundar Pichai has been 
pretty public about it. And also how India pretty much leaped from, you know, a computer to say a phone rather than go through a laptop and then tablet. So I think uh, various big companies have said that India sort of leaps through technology. So I think, I don't know if it's going to be something simple. I mean, we've seen that in digital payments as well. Basically, you know, it just sort of made it leap and the government created UPI and all these public open APIs. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that something in the justice system or in the legal system will be similar where India would just sort of, you know, bypass an entire generation of technology, which has been there in the West or in the East, and then just sort of move to the next stage altogether. Uh, but I think it'll take time. I don't think it'll be that quick. Yeah. Well, if any geography is going to pull it off, it's going to be India because there is, that's where a lot of this innovation is occurring. So I definitely have seen that too. You don't, I was in, uh, I lived in Africa for a while and I always said, people here are never going to see telephone poles. They're just going to go straight to mobile. Why would you build all the intermediary technology? It's not necessary. You can just go to the latest. But I think also about France. Uh, in the 70s, they implemented something called the Minitel, which was so cutting edge, they didn't print phone books anymore. You know, they gave you a computer and you could look everything up. And it was like, wow, the future is here. But the problem is when the when the, the public public entities get involved in technology, they leap ahead and then they build it and then they can't innovate. So then the rest of society catches up with it and then it passes by and the technology yeah. doesn't evolve. So they still had Minitels, which was like 1978 technology in 1993 uh, because the government couldn't get their act together to continue to innovate. So in the States, at least, we have this you know, creative destruction. All these companies are fighting constantly to get market share. And that means companies are dying all the time. So public technology, there's risks to it. I, I applaud what the government is doing in India, but they have to be careful that they don't get put step Absolutely. into with too heavy a foot because uh, you know it may be that they enshrine innovation where it is today and then in 10 years everybody's in quantum computing and we're still using the same retro APIs. Um, any other comments? I, I could do this all day. I'm really enjoying this. Um, any other comments or questions for Ishita or, or Vishwam? Yeah. Hey, please. Yes, hello. Sorry, I had a quick question just before we have to wind up. Hi, Vishwam. Hi, Ishita. Thank you for the presentation. That was a great product that you have there. Um, I was really impressed with how you've built in quite a few of the systems within the product, like Calendar or uh, OCR and hyperlinking and everything. But uh, as you know, there are quite a few technologies which are available externally uh, regarding calendaring, scheduling, invoicing, payments, etc., which companies, institutions, et cetera, prefer to use often. So I was wondering if uh, you have, if your product can open up to external integrations or it is something you have thought about or maybe something you would like to do down the road. No, thank you, Neil. I think we definitely think about it all the time. Uh, especially, I think one thing we've been battling about is calendar integrations because a lot of people want it, but a lot of people also want data confidentiality and sensitive at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can't have it both ways. So once you start integrating with Microsoft or Google Calendar, they will have access to your hearing names, you know, this X versus Y. Yeah. And then if you want to put more information into your calendar, then they will have access to those information. So then I can't tell them that I, or I can't guarantee any, you know, data sensitivity once it goes out to Microsoft or Google. Mm -hmm. uh, with Zoom, we had the same challenge, but then we sort of took a conscious decision that we'll integrate Zoom because uh, a lot of people wanted it. Uh, so we're not... I guess in short, we're not opposed to it, but we're sort of following a cautious approach with sort of security and data confidentiality in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously Microsoft and Google are secure, so nobody's suggesting that way, but it's just a case of, you know, whether you're comfortable sharing your information with Google or Microsoft or Zoom or Dropbox, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the only point. But but like I mentioned, we are sort of constantly exploring it. I think obviously chat GPT is another thing that we're exploring that would also involve, you know, data being shared with again with Microsoft or uh, with the others. Uh, so so we are definitely exploring it and maybe we will have integrations, more integrations in the future. Fantastic. Definitely. That's well, great. can can you please everyone join me in a round of applause 
Thakur Vishwam and Shita for their great work and for staying up so late in India to hang out with all of us. Uh, this was wonderful. Uh, we would also, uh, I'd love Vishwam for you to consider becoming a, an iCoder member or an iCoder certified. We have ethical standards for ODR platforms and, uh, you know, yours is a cutting edge platform and, and to the extent that iCoder can help you spread the word and provide some uh, ethical guidelines uh, that might build trust with your clients, we'd love to have you as a part of the community. And hopefully some of us will see you in, in Bangalore. Will you be at the ODR yes. 2023? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's excellent. Well, uh, uh, thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for joining everyone. Um, 2023 is going to be a breakthrough year. And I think you can see um, uh, WebNI is, uh, is setting the bar or what we can look forward to in some of the platforms to come. So thank you for sharing the time. Have a wonderful weekend and sleep tight. Take care, everyone. Be well. Thank you we'll so see much, you next everybody. Month. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.